He left his home in Madrid, Spain to pursue his dream of living and working in Shanghai, China. As an expert in economics and finance, his career path led him to become one of the top executives at a large venture capital firm dealing with early stage crypto companies like Binance, Polkadot, and Phantom. He made the transition to go work on the technology that is the equivalent of FDIC insurance for decentralized finance protocols. He is Alvaro Fernandez, and I am pleased to have him here on DYOR Crypto. Welcome to the DYOR Crypto Founders Report, where we speak to the leaders, pioneers, and inventors of the blockchain and crypto space. I'm Mustafa, the founder of DYOR Crypto, and if you're looking for a guide to help you navigate and research the world of blockchain and crypto, then you've come to the right place. Follow now on YouTube, Twitter, and DYOR-Crypto.com so you don't miss any of the fascinating guests that come on our show. Before we get started, guys, remember you can get this show notes and transcript to this episode by clicking the link in the description or by going to dyor-crypto.com slash show notes. Welcome back to the DYOR Crypto Founders Report. Today, our guest is Alvaro Fernandez, head of strategy at Insure Network. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here, Mustafa. It's a pleasure. It's great to have you. So Alvaro, you were previously the managing director for Europe at JRR Group, um, which is a fintech group focused exclusively on disruptive innovations. Um, You also consulted for Forex division of DBS Singapore, which is a big bank in Singapore. And you did consulting for the Italian Undersecretary of State for Economic Development. Um, so that tells me you've got quite a bit of experience in economics and finance and not just, um, local economics, local finance, but international, because now you work for insure network, uh, you're the head of strategy there. Not only that, but you, you live in Shanghai, uh, which is, which is really interesting. So you've got quite a, a resume and you've, you've been, uh, around the world. You've been to many different places. So we're gonna have a lot of questions for you today, um, especially about uh, the the things that you specialize in finance, insurance, um, and uh, blockchain technology. So can you take us back to the very beginning? Can you take us to the beginning of your professional career? Perhaps tell us a little bit about, about um, how you, you got started uh, your, with your education maybe. Yeah, so, I was having a fairly different path than uh, what most of the users or most of the scholars would be that after finishing school, you would uh, directly drift to university at the age of 18 and just drive ahead with undergrad and eventually see whether you're going to do your master's or get located in, in corporate. In my case, uh, I was not so sure what I, what I wanted to study. So I did a dual apprenticeship for, for two years in, in Madrid, where I was born and raised. And it was a fairly interesting opportunity because they were basically matching uh, students that were applying with uh, with companies, with international companies that were willing to take uh, some sort of intern. But uh, for those two years, basically, they would be providing the education, the two years finance, fi- fi- um, financing for, for the education. Mm-hmm. And during that time, also going through all the departments of the of the of the company so in in my case i was basically joining uh one of the big three companies in in agriculture so basically after the two years of uh, apprenticeship uh education and internship in the in the company i i was quite comfortable at the time uh young man fresh in in his 20s uh offered quite a decent job in in madrid to eventually joining one of the bigger corporations in, in agriculture and and got located in international logistics so mm-hmm. i was engaging with uh, with the mother company which was located in in germany um, i'm half german personally uh I, I don't i was not mentioning that so native german native spanish that was one of the reasons why i was being put in in, in that situation which i was fairly comfortable with the thing is that after merely one year, I was realizing that uh, corporate life, at least that kind of industry, was was not my thing. Mm-hmm. I was feeling stagnated, already stuck in a in a hamster wheel, basically at the at the age of almost twenty one. And uh, 
given the situation that I was already engaging with certain parts of um, of corporate education, which was especially the, the finance and, and economic part in a very light way and in that dual apprenticeship for, for the two years, uh, that, that provided me the, the, the direction to, to know that I, I definitely wanted to go and, and study economics. So eventually I ventured myself into, into going to Germany to, to study economics and finance in, uh, in a small city called Osnabrück. Where, where my father used to be studying as well. And uh, everything was, was quite unexpected. So while, while studying there, spending my close to three years for the studies, uh, towards the end, I was having an, an internship to be expected to, to basically I had to, to fulfill. And uh, I was having quite some curiosity, some, some desire for, for, for China, for, for Asia in general. I was at the time just being in, in Thailand, so I was feeling quite... Uh, willing to explore other parts of the globe, uh, the Western side I was already quite familiar with. Used to be living for a, for a year in London. Did Germany already plenty of times in in the US, even though only only visits. So I was getting quite curious about about the Eastern side of the globe, and uh, really for for not too much preference, I basically turned to to end up in Shanghai, and that's what changed my my career path completely. So. August 2017, I, I landed in Shanghai. I was eventually fi finalizing the 12-week the internship in, in a Shanghainese university called Donghua. And uh, during that time, uh, it, was, it was close towards the, the peak euphoria of the, of the previous cycle. And uh, it turns out that Shanghai was a very vibrant community for, for blockchain. So I just adventured myself to to go into to to a, to a blockchain related event that was here. Um, I was already having a little bit of my eyes in, in what Bitcoin was and everything since uh, one of my professors and mentioned it in in finance in I think it was like late 2015 class uh, when we were eventually speaking about the about the uh, world financial crisis 2008. But very superficially, eventually having an eye on it, keeping track, and not really immersing myself a uh, full time. And uh, when I went to that event, I will I'll never forget. It was it was a Friday evening, scheduled, and it was quite rainy. I was trying to force myself to go. I, I was literally about to say, "All right." Uh, let's just leave it. Maybe we can, you know, as a student, eventually you would have some preferences for, for you know, having some fun for your three months stay in, in Shanghai. But I got myself together and I went. And that's probably one of the most game-changing uh, factors that, that, that I took, which, which have completely paved the beginning of my, of my career path in, in crypto. It was, it was an event organized by the Fudan Blockchain Association. And from that moment, from, from that event, my, my mindset completely changed. I was like, okay, I, I need to explore this industry and this industry within the environment where I'm at, which is China. And uh, first step that I did was talk to the, the guys, uh, also students back at the time at Fudan Blockchain Association, tell them, hey, I want to get involved. Learned everything I can while helping organizing events, meeting interesting people. And it was the, the second event where I met one of my former managing partners for the first fund that I engaged with, which uh, immediately so, uh, provided me with an, with an internship. The, the moment that uh, we, we basically knew each other for like about one and a half months until the end of my, of my internship, of, of my of my three months here in, in Shanghai for the, for the student exchange. And at that time, uh, he provided me with an internship when, in, in, in that previous fund called Chain Funder. And uh, because it was a good fit, I could eventually uh, finish career and uh, try and finish the, the, the studies from here, eventually distance and, and do the internship on its way, which was very, very uh, aligned with what I was eventually striving for. I wanted to actually explore on a, on a deeper way. With, with everything which was blockchain, crypto, and, and eventually China. Uh, I took the internship for, for the six months and it was a fairly early stage for, for the fund. So I was uh, one of the first six people in, in the fund at the time and eventually grew to, uh, I think it was about 20, 25 
because it grew to also some other divisions in terms of incubation and some side products that were being directly in-house incubated. So that completely basically made me extend my estate. And uh, from there on, after the, the six month internship, I, I got the job offer. And that's when you start realizing, whoa, it's not just a couple of months in, in Shanghai. It's not just some exchange, not just some internship. It's actually a potential career change and, and try and eventually set yourself in, in, in Shanghai, at least for the time being, and see how things evolve. Uh, the job offer was for, for investment management. And I, I did that. I, I basically took it. So from from there on, I was I was spending about I think it was another year without counting the in, internship or one and a half years if I remember well. Uh, yeah, one and a half years until like December, and then the next year that I was engaging with with this fund first as investment manager. Then I drifted towards pivoted slightly into into incubation management with one of the protocols that uh, that we found at the time interesting and, and decided to, to participate in, in early stage um, and from there on I was participating a lot with uh, not only the, the investment side incubation side but also with everything which is related to to European markets so every every kind of resources partners that we would have i would potentially be the one traveling to to the european side different conferences that we were being invited to for for attendance for for the potential networking scouting of, of early stage projects and and so on and before you realize i was i was completely immersed in in, in the crypto industry by by basically mid 2018 and uh, i think it was end of 2019 so sorry uh, january 20 2019 2020 yeah so january 2019 it was basically when the situation came to an end i i received a job offer with with a different fund which you mentioned previously which is uh, jrr crypto or jr group uh, also known and uh, I joined with them also for eventually covering the, the investment side and uh, some of the consulting for, for some of the portfolio projects and external third party projects. And then eventually grew with them for about one year and a couple of months until uh, I was eventually fully in charge with the, with the European markets. I was officially VP and, uh, and the head of European markets, uh, managing director for, the, for European markets until summer 2020 and during that time things even uh, scaled up to the, to the next level so that's when the different engagements uh, occurred uh, such as the, the dbs uh, circumstance it was it, it all started basically with a with a conference that that was happening in, in singapore it was it was block show through some some previous partner at uh, at jrr we got introduced to the forex division and and they were basically interested. So that was basically that was about two years ago. So we were talking about depth, depths of a bear market. The forex division of of DBS was interested in in seeing. Uh, well, after the cycle that we had, twenty seventeen, early twenty eighteen, uh, all the buzz that was going around, things calmed down. What can we actually do? And uh, it started from a very introductionary uh, approach in terms of what is crypto, what can be done, and what solutions may be some of, uh, of the potential things to consider for something like a bank, even though it's a more, I mean, if I would compare to, to, to the different corporate structures in the banking system, DBS tends to be quite uh, retail focused and innovative in, in some of their aspects. So the, well, the, their banking app, for example, for, for, for retail uh, banking is, is, is quite featureful compared to any others. And they have been putting quite a lot of effort. So in that sense, we, we basically provided the, the support to at least try and understand what's going on and what they could provide uh, to their potential customers and then move ahead with, uh, with the next steps that they would eventually take, which is uh, local jurisdictions, potential limitations, how it can be offered, etc. And the two core products, that, at least for the, for the Forex division, 
was was clearly the the implementation of structured products uh, that were already existing, such as uh, GBTC that that we know, uh, which is traded in in the futures at CME and CBOE. Uh, any kind of structured product that can be licensed and traded on their platform, because they do have a platform for for forex. And the other aspect, which would be eventually uh, the more decentralized environment. So at that time, I could say that it was the very early stages of what we know as DeFi now. So things like non-custodial wallets, decentralized wallets, and, and see how that could be potentially implemented. And it was very interesting times to, to eventually see not only from a, from a crypto perspective, uh, from a crypto native perspective that you tend to be in relation with, with uh, early stage founders, with uh, other funds, with people which are building in the industry, but also with, with corporate, you know, uh, more traditional structures that they're like, okay, uh, we're interested in this. How can we eventually make things happen in a way that we can be comfortable with and our users can be interested? In? And uh, in, in contrast to, to the situation with, uh, with a former under secretary of state, uh, Michele Garazzi. Uh, in that case, uh, they were interested in the, in more of a situation of what e-commerce between China and and Italy could be how, how it could be reinforced via blockchain. So so it was it was a committee by by different experts. Uh, me and my and my former managing partner was was part of it. And uh, because of the fact that uh, Mr. Uh, professor Garachi was uh, a professor for about 10 years in, in Shanghai, he was paying some special focus into the economic development between Italy and China. And uh, yet again, uh, a profile that was like, okay, let's look into blockchain. What can eventually be done? What can be improved? At that time, it was fairly early to say that uh, e-commerce could be directly a plug-and-play solution for, for blockchain, but at least providing the background information, similar to how it was being done with, uh, with DBS and, and in that situation, was some of the, the fundamental information and, and consulting that would be given in potential next steps of, of implementation, some early stage platforms that are eventually developing on the, on the e-commerce side or on, on different segments that may be interesting to look at. Uh, there was some very important vertical that we were presenting, which was um, immutable, um, verifiable uh, stamps from, from certain products, for example. So if we're talking about quality products, you know how the QR codes are being established. Well, that's something that a couple of uh, protocols were working at that time for on-chain verifiable data. In, in that case. So certain Italian products could eventually have that. And when, when being uh, consumed in China, they could have this verification, not precisely by scanning because it's tamperable uh, in, in many cases, but via blockchain. So that, that's basically one of the, the angles that, that could be suggested at, at the time. And uh, I must admit that these, has been, these have been some of the very interesting engagements that that I was having in the past, or at least as a contrast, as I was saying earlier, because it's it's a great industry to be in. It's it's a very exciting and fast developing uh, environment, but we tend to be uh, encountering very like minded people, and you almost, at least the way I would uh, frame it, is that you get immersed into into a parallel world. Uh, compared to what traditional finance is, compared to what the, 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 any kind of development in different industries is. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know if you felt it yourself, but uh, the mindset of, of people tends to be a little bit more of a contrast versus any kind of other industry. So having that uh, come back to the surface and see what's happening in, in traditional banking and corporates from a government perspective was something that from my side was super fulfilling to see and see how can this industry actually move forward from a way that you don't understand only what the industry wants from the inside, but also from the outside, because you eventually want to have the certain levels or stages of adoption. And uh, to, to put a side note in, in this case, uh, because me personally, I feel quite identified and I would say responsible up to a certain extent to try and, and put my little bits and pieces into, into helping towards the adoption since, since the early stages. Um, also because of my way of getting in, which was through the Bufudan Blockchain Association, 
Uh, I was co-founding together with uh, with four partners, uh, Crypto Mondays for for Shanghai. So, so some of the bits and pieces that that we were doing was trying to create a, a non-profit uh, environment or offline uh, medium of exchange of information, trying to bring the the experts in the industry. You know, and uh, that was a lot of fun at the time. So this is something that we've been ongoingly doing since uh, late to the set to the no. Early 2018, I think it was, and uh, for about until mid 2019, and at that time we're starting very fairly low, or or like small scale, uh, but uh, it gained quite some traction. It was it was great to see that it became one of the the main uh, nonprofit event structures in in Shanghai, which is one of the hubs of of, of blockchain related uh, uh, for blockchain in in China, and. Uh, the peak was when when we had an event where it was multiple hundreds of people, very vibrant community that was recurrently coming to, to the events, live stream with with thousands of people as well, uh, and we have profiles from from any kind of like leading uh, blockchains at the time, protocols at the time. I remember Bobby Lee, which is one of the the uh, co-founding mef- members of the Bitcoin Foundation, was was recurrently coming because fortunately he was being based in in Shanghai as well. So it was great to being able to to not only uh, create the format for being able to provide at least one way of a step in into crypto. So not only catering the more advanced profiles in in the industry, which were. Uh, very often coming from uh, different fund managers in, in the industry, which would be based in Shanghai to more experienced protocol uh, co-founders and stuff, but really more centering as well into the, the more entry level potential community member for the crypto industry and really trying to proliferate and promote the situation of there's no entry level uh, questions that should be not asked. So anything should be eventually discussed. And, and the format that we were having was a usually a panel discussion and then very open questions and, and, and really trying to reinforce and, and incentivize people to, to also step in and, and ask as well. So th- those were a lot of fun days that we were having uh, every two or three Mondays of, of the month. The thing is that we eventually ran out of speakers. We ran out of topics. Scalability, pri- privacy, uh, on-chain, non-custodial wallets, uh, everything that we could eventually have. Uh, whether it was from like people, as I said, coming from overseas, that it was either for a punctual conference or, or whatever it was to the to the local experts, because like fortunately Shanghai has a, has a very vast and, and, and diverse uh, community, I would, I would tend to say. Um, sadly, we, we basically ran out of speakers and, and topics and, and that matched with the, with the depths of the, of the bear market towards end of 2019. So, so we put it into a pause and uh, we're kind of bringing it back. And this is about three, four months uh, because we see the demand. It's, it's just a side thing that, that we've been doing. But it's definitely one of the things that have been bringing me a lot of uh, reward in, in terms of our fulfillment uh, at the at personal level in, in, in the industry since, since I joined together with the more professional aspect that's, that I was mentioning earlier. And uh, to eventually drift forward into basically mid 2020, summer 2020, uh, that was one of the, the drastic changes that, that I took. And um, some of the, one of my good friends and, and previous uh, co worker, basically at, at the first fund that, that I was at that chain fund, uh, he used to be the investment director approached me and he was he was telling me that he was having an idea in in terms of uh, DeFi and, and very focused on on insurance and i was already checking uh, personally i was i was quite enthusiastic about about DeFi. i was i was uh, quite early in terms of uh, uniswap v1 engaging with with every every kind of innovation that was that was going on i was i was at that time still still sitting at uh, at jrr and uh, everything that would be eventually coming out from from like next mutual, for example, which was one of the catalysts for for insurance to any kind of other protocols such as compound and, and so on. So he knew that I was having a special interest for for that, and he was proposing me to to eventually uh, join to 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 basically make it happen. So yeah, so my my previous colleague at the time, uh, Jeffrey, 
was was eventually suggesting me to to join uh, the the venture that he was building up uh, together with uh, with uh, some other co-founders, uh, Alex Peng, one of more veteran in, in terms of of insurance, and uh, and Li Fan Chan, which is our our current CTO as well, and. I was personally quite enthusiastic about what was happening with with the insurance vertical in in DeFi, because I was as I was seeing things unfold at a, at a personal level, uh, things were moving quite fast. So I was feeling that this was one of the next waves in in terms of innovation that was to to mature in in the industry. Very much unlike the the situation in 2017, where many of the coins were either layer ones, so a lot of competition that we had at the time with with a lot of blockchains and different solutions from uh, sharding to like any kind of models that were, that were coming up, proof of stake, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, protocols themselves, they they were not really maturing that much, at least uh, at that time in, in Ethereum. So this was the first time uh, a novel environment or circumstance where you were seeing things paving in the right direction and a, a, at a very fast uh, path, basically. So when I was seeing how decentralized exchanges were maturing, how lending protocols were really coming up and being utilized, the, the first question that I was thinking, okay, like if you compare this with traditional environments, where there is a central party as a custodial actor, which is eventually taking the responsibility and the liability for it. What are the challenges that you're going to have if it's a decentralized environment? And how are you going to eventually take the, the safety for the, or, or build the, the layer of, of security for the users that are going to be engaging? And the situation was being clear as time was passing. So with uh, different exploits and different tools that were being utilized, whether it was uh, flash loan attacks or directly uh, bugs in the, in the code or potential uh, ways around the logic in the, in the protocols. Uh, that, was, that was personally something that I felt very interested in. So I was very willing to eventually take the, Take the, the take the step and say, okay, I'm gonna move from the from the VC driven career that I was pursuing at the time that I was very comfortable with, with uh, with a more entrepreneurial side. Part of me always wanted to have this uh, because I must admit that uh, sitting on one side of the table mm-hmm. may bias you a lot in 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 your point of view and the way that you're abstracting and, and concising what you're seeing in the industry. So if you're sitting on the on the investment side only. Uh, I must say that, I mean, not especially sinning, but uh, you could get quite spect- skeptical about uh, innovation in the industry. So there, there's so many things that you have seen in terms of early stage tasks have not been converted into what were being pictured at the time at a potential seed round or private round that you tend to be quite skeptical about uh, any kind of new pitch, for example. So, so the, the way that I was listening to, to pitches over those two and a half, three years evolved a lot. So from, from being completely eyes and ears and trying to picture the, the situation to, 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 to rather being more concise and, and, and try to see the flaws in the system first. And if I don't see any potential flaws, then eventually you can go to the next step in terms of due diligence. So, Eventually, putting yourself on the other side of the table, I think it would be a good experience for for some time and and see how it goes. So that was one of the motives that was driving one one of the, the various motives so that, that I was mentioning that that would drive me to to eventually move to the to the entrepreneurial side. And uh, for now, it's been basically one year, and uh, well, uh, product has been shipped from from our side on on the Ethereum main chain. Uh, it was in April that we launched mainnet. It's been some great advancements in the development, basically. And uh, one of the core concepts that, that we were trying to change with, with, with Insure was, was basically the, the maturity of, of, of what insurance can provide and trying to go towards the, the ideology and narrative that I was mentioning earlier of how can you insure and provide the security layer for the different user profiles that are going to be engaging now and tomorrow. And, and DeFi. 
Right. So let me actually ask you about the um, the Insure Network. So uh, how long ago did you say you got started with Insure and uh, when you became the um, head of strategy there? So I personally joined in, in July uh, okay. 2020. Yeah. Okay. So oh, it's, okay. it's about one year ago. Okay. Got it. And um, that was from a proposal from your friend, right? Because he knew you were um, right. on that side. That was your, your area of expertise since you studied finance and um, economics in, in university. Um, so w what would you say is the, the most um, complicated thing about the, what you do? And um, as a head of strategy for a company that uh, is essentially trying to uh, disrupt the insurance industry, um, what, what's the biggest uh, challenge and complication in uh, what you do uh, for the company that you, for the project that you're working on? Yeah, that's, that's a question that I was asking myself a few times because uh, when you look at it from the, from the surface, when, when we're talking about uh, strategy, for at a protocol level. Uh, previously, it was eventually consulting portfolio projects, uh, which which were invested by by the fund that was the, I was engaged at the time. Uh, you can always provide that strategic consulting in terms of what maybe some of the good suggestions of move or or moves for 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 the protocol and try and provide value as an investor. But when you're as an entrepreneur, which was exactly what I was mentioning earlier, to see things from the other side of the table, if you look at it superficially, uh, yeah, sure, you're going to be very interested and willing to focus on providing insurance, but it doesn't end there, because when you're building a decentralized protocol. Eventually, you're having a community, and it's a community which are your users, not, not precisely your speculators, but the people who are actually going to utilize the platform. So as in terms of what strategy concerns, you're going to try to cater not only to them, but also to a potential audience that may not be there yet. Let's say institutional, or let's say at the time, for example, let's say institutional, or let's say any kind of more traditional uh, profile or more sophisticated or, you know, as, as, as the industry evolves as well, there's a lot of iterations that have to be made eventually as well. So it's really about trying to find uh, not only what you want to cater to your community, but also outside of that community, what may be the needs and the demands from potential users that are involving in DeFi outside of what you're providing and eventually try to cater to them. And when you ask that question, uh, whether it's your existing community or potentially joining community, you don't really often come to a situation where people know what they want. So you try to innovate and iterate on the way as well. And we're in a constantly evolving process with that. So with, with Ensure, with the, one of the great examples that we were having was the situation of deploying an Ethereum. Why? Because an insurance protocol or the or, or the vertical of insurance is 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 a bit different to different towards the the different components that we see in in in, in DeFi. It's it's basically relying. It's it's one of the later coming building blocks that I would say. Why? Because you need to have the complete full stack environment, the, the 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 ecosystem which is there that you can provide the insurance to. You know, it's not like you can just go in, into a Let's say if, if Cardano was to launch tomorrow, that you are the first protocol to launch on Cardano. Why? Because you're relying on insuring on those other protocols. So it's a later building block and you're eventually looking for, for that maturity in terms of the ecosystem, in terms of the different layers of what's, uh, what the users are engaging. So that's one of the important things to, to eventually consider. And uh, challenges on the way that we were having, as I was uh, going to go towards this topic earlier, is that at the time of coming up with the idea, Ethereum was without a doubt the more established ecosystem. And uh, we're talking about one year ago, okay? So we're talking about uh, pre-Polygon boom, pre-BSC uh, uh, catalyst in terms of adoption with, with the different protocols and, 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 and implementations. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the way that we wanted to direct the, the development was, without a doubt, Ethereum-based. I mean, the biggest ecosystem at the time. Now, the fees were 
not precisely expensive. So when we started the development, we were talking about Ethereum being at something like $250, $300 and eventually scaling up. Fees were still fairly cheap. And after six, nine months of development and uh, the different alphas, iterations on different test environments that we were having, uh, shortly after launching, we were in a situation where Ethereum was completely booming and fees were going through the roof. I, I can I can imagine that quite a few are feeling familiar with it. It was called stats. DeFi Summer. DeFi Summer, uh the summer of 2020, right? That was that was one of them. But when it really hit the fan was early this year. I mean, uh, there was three figure uh in terms of USD um uh, fees being paid on Ethereum for engaging with, with certain amounts of, 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 of contracts, basically. And the more complexity yeah. you're having in the contract structures, the more expensive it's, uh, it's eventually getting. So that was not an issue at the time of thinking. So that's where, in terms of strategy, you need to eventually identify where you should be going towards next. So at that point, it became clear for us that uh, after understanding our community a little bit better, it was quite worthful to eventually look at scaling solutions, which is what we're doing right now with Polygon, for example, that we're about to, to launch a, a set marketplace on, on Polygon, where the where the scaling is, is fairly well adopted and fairly stable, and, and one of the best choices eventually to, to go for, as well as Binance Smart Chain, where we, we received a, a grant as well. And and some developments on the site uh, from from earlier stages, such as such as Polkadot as well. So yes, that's what I was going to ask you about next. Was um, you started? What was the first um, iteration of your of your uh, project built on? So the first choice uh, came actually through a through a direct contact with the Web Three Foundation. Uh, we applied for for a grant to to eventually deploy on on Polkadot and and we got granted and uh, eventually the deployment deployment started but as we know with with Polkadot it's being a, a constant development by itself as well so we were trying to figure out and see what are the best ways in terms of develop so the the first iteration that we did was to uh, deploy on Moonbeam which is a completely EVM compatible uh, side chain or, or power chain for for Polkadot, and eventually move forward with a little bit more natively based uh, code on on Ink. In in this case, one of the programming languages more native to to Polkadot, to eventually see the the, the more scalable integrations. And uh, this is not publicly announced yet, but we just hit the the first milestone and are in process of eventually so launching the, a, the release. Uh, what does a project um organization need to do in order to be qualified for a web3 found uh web3 uh funding um that's something i've always been curious about how did you guys get the funding for web3 um what what qualifies yeah. a company for that or an organization or group so i was i was quite pleasantly surprised with uh, with the web3 foundation they're literally looking for different teams and different tech that may be interesting to plug in into into the ecosystem and they're very willing to fund parts of the development in order to have the first uh, steps in terms of integrations and and deployment of of code and and and, and applications so there is not really a, a form i would say which would tell you if you have this yes if you have this no uh, they're quite keen on 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 innovation they're quite keen on talent basically and uh, in our case, uh, we we went through a couple of rounds of uh, well, first the, the application itself in terms of presenting the the protocol, then eventually going a bit deeper with uh, some of the members of the Web3 Foundation to understand how it could be a potential good fit for for Polkadot as well, and it eventually resulted in a in a successful grant application from from our side. Yeah. So you, would you say would you agree if I said that your uh, primary innovation is insurance related when it comes to insure network. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, the protocol is is, is very very driven in terms of uh, at least the first stages that we're looking at in terms of the insurance provision 
for for native environments in in, in DeFi and crypto and, and, and not only Ethereum but in multiple chains. And uh, to go into into like how we're trying to innovate in in the space, it's if you look at the first generation of of insurance uh, application applications, what you're having is mostly the model of a mutual. Okay, so you're sharing the risks among the different participants of a, of a, of, a, of a community, basically of, of, of a protocol of an application. And um, my co-founders and, and I eventually, well, my, my co-founders at, at first stage, I was I was joining a bit a bit later in July. I said, uh, identified that there is different models that may be interesting to at least uh, take a look if it's could potentially work uh, to implement and to adapt into into the native environment of, of blockchain. So you have the the model of what a mutual is, which I believe it's it's fairly fairly familiar for for many in terms of what traditional mutuals how they how they work, which is the different participants sharing the risk among each other, pooling risks and covering each other. You have the shareholder model. Which is the the more established and, and and bigger insurance companies that you can see nowadays in terms of Allianz, Aon, and and the vast majority uh, of of insurance companies that you're having now, which are them uh, being the counterparty for the risk and coming up with the actuary models and the potential risk assessments for the potential premiums and the adjustments for how those insurance policies can be provided in a way which are not only competent for the users but also uh, rentable for them where, where there's actually a revenue seeking interest i have a but question a about uh, yeah. uh insurance and risk so i'd like to just kind of zoom out a little bit go to the macro perspective insurance is not a new concept and neither is risk um what we're doing here is it seems to me that we're taking a very old traditional finance concept and we're applying it to uh the blockchain but how do you define in your own words um what is what is risk um if i could also just interject here your white paper defines insurance as a tool that helps redistribute risk across a community maybe you can elaborate um, expand upon that but i really want to know what is your definition of risk because that word to me is um it, it just means so many different things but i'd like to know what your take is on that as uh, someone who who's uh, specialized in that yeah so the simplest way i could explain it is related to the concept of exposure so risk is basically the exposure that you're having from a often at least in our case financial uh, perspective it could be in, in traditional terms uh, more of a health perspective or, or different kind of of risks that you may be having from like illnesses, et cetera, but that's not really what we're covering. So from our case, the, the financial exposure that you're having over a potentially unforeseen circumstance, over an unexpected event, such as exploits, such as hacks, such as drains of funds, especially when engaging with different DeFi protocols. And eventually the counterparty, which would be willing to be absorbing that risk. So it can be a mutual, which is absorbing it all together. It can be a, a, a situation where you're having underwriters which are willing to be taking that risk because of a potential information asymmetry or just really uh, going deeper into the potential due diligence that they have found and that they see that currently there is quite some demand for the specific product and the premiums are quite attractive for bearing this risk and they will be quite interested and willing on taking this counterparty side of the risk. So it's really about that. It's not only about the, the risk and the exposure, it's about how it's being traded, how it's being covered and how it's being transferred as well to the, to the counterparty, which is willing to cover it. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And thank you for clarifying that. The, um, hmm. You also mentioned in the white paper that the, uh, the concept uh, comes from uh, Lloyd's London, uh, and I'm referring to the concept of your, of your product. Um, yeah. Can you tell us what Lloyd's London is and how it works? Yeah, so this this idea was being sourced by by my co-founder Alex, which has been in insurance for the past, I believe it was 10, 12 years. And uh, he is being very familiar with the different insurance models. And one of them is the, is the model of Lloyd's of London. It's uh, nothing of the 
peak in terms of technology is actually sourced from a marketplace that was established naturally in the, I believe it was early 1800s. Forgive me if I'm wrong, Alex. <laughs> it was basically from the early 1800s, I believe it was. And uh, what it's based on, it's, uh, it's an agreement between different parties which are engaging and willing to be trading the risk, which was at the time occurring with, with freight. With, with basically ships and cargoes that were coming with, uh, with uh, at least at that time in terms of the different international or, or like colony transfer of values and goods and services and the risks that were happening. So it was not only the, the, the different storms or losses of, of cargo, it was at the time also potential uh, boycotts or, or like eventually from a, from a pirate perspective, that was a fairly often situation in, in the Caribbean. But anyway, to go back to what the model was, it was a situation where you were having a syndicate which was uh, maturing into a three-party model. You were having the, the, the parties interested in, in purchasing the insurance. So the, the, the merchants that were at the time uh, basically um, engaging with, with commerce. You were having the underwriters uh, from, from a syndicate perspective, which were willing to, to underwrite the risks and that were being negotiated. And it was fairly sophisticated, you know, because it's it was a marketplace with plenty of actors from one side and on the other that would be eventually trading and negotiating the risks and how they would be eventually set for this kind of deal, you know, and constantly ongoing and ongoing. And the, and the capital providers. So the capital providers acting in a more passive way in terms of providing the collateral that would be potentially needed for collateralizing the risks where, where underwriters would be eventually engaging with as well. So in, in, in exchange for a part of the, of the premium, the, the capital providers would be eventually providing that collateral. So that's a, it's a very simple model, but it matured in, in what the biggest model is in terms of insurance. And uh, that's where we sourced the, the, the idea from. And uh, the way that we implemented it was through the marketplace that you can see today, where you can not only engage in a sophisticated way as a, as a policy buyer, where you buy what, whatever policy that you're interested in, but also as an underwriter. So if I'm gonna be the counterparty, which is gonna be underwriting this risk, I, from our perspective, uh, a bit of an increase in sophistication versus the model of a mutual, instead of having the, the shared risks, but having a more uh, targeted uh, environment where you can say, okay, I'm willing to cover this risk, but maybe not that one because of the premium rate difference, because of the risk exposure, because of your own edge as an individual or as an institution that may be interested in underwriting this risk. And also the third aspect, which is the, which is the capital providers, basically. So the capital providers in our system is, 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 is basically the actor which is providing the capacity and the capital into a reserve pool called, called the capital pool in, in, our, in our protocol, which is providing the needs and the means for the for the for the different insurance policies for the active policy value to be collateralized so we have a certain degree of leverage that is allowed uh, we started with a more um, conservative approach uh, depending on the rating on every single protocol which is also one of the things that uh, we were innovating on so what we identified that we needed was a risk assessment individual for every single protocol because it's not uh, that there is a, a sharing in terms of risk. It's that every single user by itself should at least have maximum information possible to identify and understand the potential risks if they're interested and willing to underwrite. So in order to make the things easier for those counterparties that may be willing to absorb it, providing this kind of information was, was a vital importance from, from our perspective, as well as for the risk factor itself. Mm -hmm. The uh, insurance industry um, is is multi 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 trillion dollar industry. Um, could you give us maybe some facts and figures about the biggest and who are the biggest players in the traditional finance insurance, and how are you? How do you see what's your vision for insurance on chain uh, versus off chain? Like, what's what's the future of insurance look like to you? Yeah, so. One of the visions that, that my, my co-founder uh, has is to eventually have a marketplace which not only caters to 
DeFi native risks in this case, because this kind of structure, at least the marketplace that we're uh, that we're building and, and we're all looking to expand in in, in in basically future iterations, can go beyond what DeFi is. Can go beyond what smart contract exposure is. It can go into different kinds of natural catastrophes, for example. It can go into a more mature uh, circumstance where not only DeFi native or blockchain native users may be interested, but to a point where we have a circumstance where we have profiles across the world where, where which are interested and, and confident enough in, in buying insurance, not only from the traditional insurance provider, but also from an on-chain platform. So that would be one of the verticals in terms of going beyond what, what blockchain is. But if we go towards the niche of blockchain, because there's so many uh, branches in terms of, of how insurance can, can innovate, where I believe is we're still in an infant stage. So to give you some figures and, and metrics, uh, I was just looking the other day, uh, we're sitting on something like 60 billion uh, total value locked across, across different trains in terms of the, the different use cases and protocols that are being utilized at this stage. And uh, the penetration, the, 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 the actual penetration from, from insurance is, is, is approximately 1%. That means that 99% of the value which is being currently uh, deployed in all those different protocols is not able to be, to be covered. So the, the potential upside of there is, is, is quite big. And if we go towards the maturity of how this may thrive, you also have several branches. So, so we can talk about aggregators, for example. So what, 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 I, what we're envisioning from, from our team basically is, is a situation where all those different insurance providers are eventually being plugged into a potential aggregation platform. And that aggregator is providing you a more optimized in a more sophisticated approach for when you want to buy an insurance, a, a next level, a next step in terms of the ease of use from a, from a user perspective in terms of the policy buyer. So right now it's the, the liquidity and the, and the capacity in, term, in terms of insurance is, is quite fragmented as, 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 as well. So the different providers, they, they have their own solutions. Uh, but one of the things that I could envision to, to come next is, is, is something like an aggregate, for example. If we go beyond this, um, we were mentioning, or I was mentioning earlier, the the risk assessment for the for the different protocols. This is something that, at current stage, uh, we have experts in in team that are that are working on this and providing the the insights for for providing this kind of ratings for the for the risk parameter for calculating the premiums. But what if you actually open this up to to a potential community? where the community itself is in an incentivized structure, which are same as you could say auditors in terms of institutional auditing uh, or risk provision and risk assessment, or what we know as rating agencies in, in traditional in, in terms of standard and poor's and, and different rating agencies, combined into a, into a potential layer of incentivized profiles in terms of their, the users themselves, which are scouting and providing the information needed, maybe with something like a reputational uh, score, which is supporting on the legitimacy of the information which is provided, being prov provided, but uh, creating that environment. So striving a little bit more towards what uh, decentralization may be able to achieve in terms of not only the what we're seeing with the different protocols, but also with insurance and, and this kind of risk assessments is one of the, the clear circumstances that I can be envisioning for the for the next three to five years to, to actually mature eventually together with other sites in terms of the, the aggregation and the and liquidity pooling for, for insurance as well. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, this reminds me of a couple of movies uh, here um, in the West that we're familiar with, the uh, John Q, um, where a, a a a young boy um needs a new heart and he's unable to get it because the they didn't have insurance right they didn't have health care mm -hmm. um so his father holds several people hostage in the hospital until they give up and they give him the heart um another mm -hmm. movie called rainmaker um matt damon comes uh he defends a poor family from uh an insurance company who uh, sort of predatory uh, insurance company that um, is allowing people to die on the cause of 
not giving them the insurance that they need yes. when they need it, um, even though so. it, they should be, even though they should, you know, they're, it's a legitimate claim, but they're denying the claim. Um, one thing that I noticed that you guys talk about is that you kind of prevent that using this, uh, using this, um, this type of technology, you can prevent insurance companies from being predatory and not providing their end of the, of the, uh, delivering their end of the, of the, um, of the value. So, um, maybe you can, uh, elaborate a little bit about how your protocol in the future, maybe, uh, or maybe even now is preventing, um, companies or insurers from not be from, you know, uh, holding back on becoming the same predators. Exactly. Yeah, th this is a great point. And this is something that really helps understanding uh, one of the core differences of traditional insurance versus uh, decentralized based approaches for insurance protocols. And if you ask yourself this question, who is benefiting out of providing the insurance, you will realize that in traditional insurance, it's a for profit business. It's a very, very uh, meticulously calculated for profit business. And it's a lot about numbers, a lot about, about actuary, and a lot about eventually denying claims that, uh, well, whether they, I mean, arguably in this, in this movie were, were uh, legitimate or, or, or in real life may not be. Uh, there's a situation where maybe life's at stake and it's just being calculated by pure numbers. So if you look at it, if you translate it into a protocol-based insurance, um, it's not, it's not, there's no company behind it. It's, it's basically a decentralized governance. It's basically by the community for the community. So the, the, the users who are profiting out of selling insurance are the, are the underwriters in, in our case. Um, so the, the incentives and, and, and setting the, the economic model, the, the strategy for, for this financial model that you're applying for the token economy and the different levels of engagement and interaction are one of the core concepts that you need to set in stone appropriately in order to avoid a debalancing in terms of how the actors may be, may be um, how do you say, capable of influencing the protocol. But to deeply root beyond that, there's no company behind it. It's not like I'm profiting when, when, there is, when there's insurance policies that are being sold. It's not like the premium is going to the insured network company and that's going to be a P&L base uh, uh, calculation every, at the end of the, of the financial year and we're going to eventually have bonuses. No, it's, it's not really like that. So you're having the situation where the protocol is actually not only deciding on what may be the new interesting uh, uh, concepts to list or, or the different premiums to adjust. And, and that's actually the, the vision that we're, that we're trying to create to, to create a more decentralized environment, but also the, the different levels of interaction by the different users. So by the different profiles that you're having in the, in the protocol itself. So this is one of the clear de factors or denominators of the difference between traditional insurance and protocol-based decentralized approach for a marketplace. So, yeah. So um, w let's talk about how things are becoming data-driven, right? Like I've got my car insurance mm -hmm. company can track uh, if I let them, um, which I don't. They can they can track how I'm driving, and you know they give me yeah. a, a rate discount. Um, I guess, and they will always be thirsty for more data as well. Yeah, so I want so to talk about that. Providing the data. Yeah. So, so what 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 do um, uh, what are some of the prospects for 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 this uh, data collection, and how does that affect things in the future moving forward? The more data we have, what what happens? So this is a, this is a very interesting one that, that you're raising as well, because this is one of the the segments that uh, my colleagues, which are more traditionally insurance uh, ex experience, uh, were having a challenge with, which is uh, sample size and data itself. You know, coming from a background of Aeon or Allianz, like some of our colleagues, where you're having, if you mentioned car insurance, if you have a red Ford Fiesta, for example, your sample size is literally on the millions. And the optimization of that data is very accurate. But how is it for, for blockchain-based insurance? Because every single protocol is unique in its own way. The code is going to be 
different in its own way. Yes, sure, you're going to have components which are being forked or which are being implemented by, by other protocols taken and, and borrowed. I don't know if it's a Uniswap AMM pool for the, for the potential pool itself and being adopted on a different environment. Yeah, sure, you're going to have that integration. But the sample size that you're having is not even comparable to anything else in terms of traditional insurance. The level of uniqueness of the insurance that is being provided is, is massive in, in, in this case. So one of the challenges that, that we were facing was, okay, how do you create a, a risk assessment model? And we, we started eventually stepping in with different uh, approaches. So we, we created our, our own rating mechanism, our own rating system, the NSCOS, uh, ensure smart contract security rating and system, basically, for trying to look at every single component that may be affecting on, on the potential reputability and risk of a, of a protocol. It can be the code quality, it can be the previous audits, it can be the previous exploits, it can be the community interaction, it can be the amount of TVL which has been in the, in the protocol in the past, it can be the robustness for how long that code has been exposed to, it can be the complexity of it. it is, it's a full set of of different parameters that we have added into consideration and, and you can actually find in our in our documentation. But not to bore in, in, into that and to, to drive towards your question, I believe that the more we move forward, the more iterations we're going to see in this in this in this industry in terms of uh, protocols and, and what is being built. So the flow, the sample size eventually is, is just going to go in, in one direction and it's going to increase even though there's a lot of flow and iteration on the, on the innovation side. So you're always gonna encounter new codes, new platforms, new technologies that uh, the sample size may be low. You, you, can, you can basically say, say or strive that the, the data is and, and the sample size is just gonna go upwards. And the way that this would eventually implement, be implemented towards the risk assessment, for example, and the risk parameters is potential more accuracy. On the, on the premium rates. So coming into a circumstance where, uh, to go back to the same example, if you're having a red Ford Fiesta and you're having this kind of driver profile, you pretty much can't predict without even calling the insurance company. You just can go and open a website and you can already expect what kind of premium you're gonna pay. While at this stage, if you are in, in DeFi, it's really gonna depend on the, on the circumstances. It's gonna depend in our case on the supply and demand, which we implemented the supply and demand curve uh, for, for a more balanced environment, but also the, the constant risks and new exploits that may be happening in the industry and the different TVL sizes, the, the potential size of the insurance that you want to be bought. So it's not really that optimized yet. With the recent Rune hack that just happened, um, are you familiar with you're familiar with that uh, recent hack, right? Seven million um, I think was lost. I'm fairly familiar. There was a misunderstanding. It was the first understood. It was 23 million. At the end, it was seven million, and it was an exploit in the in the code logic. It's, if I if I remember well, where where some of the validators uh, could be eventually drawn in a in a way where where part of the, of the funds could be extracted from the from different balls that were in 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 fortune. Maybe you can share with us some facts and figures about um, the history of exploits and how insurance on chain and um, uh, protocols like yours have um, sort of indemnified some of the damages. Uh, could you maybe give us, do you have any like rough estimates or rough statistics, how much money was lost, how much uh, insurance came to rescue? Yeah, so uh, in, in, in our case, in our protocol, um, we try to drift away and avoid uh, speculation over insurance, okay? Because if you if you take a look at how risks are being traded and managed, you can very easily drive into a situation where you can speculate upon it if there's no proof of loss, for example. So it can get quite close to what options are in the market, in financial markets. It's basically a, a hedge, an insurance against price volatility, what, what traditional options are, whether they're European or American. So trying to drift away from that, we are eventually um, focusing on a more proof of loss based uh, insurance where the, the claim process that uh, the, the, the users would have to face is to realize the loss and eventually provide the, the documentation, the, the proof basically that they have uh, lost xyz in, in in this in this protocol and that protocol um 
but for fortune or unfortune, uh, we have not had any kind of claim before because any of the all of the of the protocols that we're currently covering, which is twenty two in, in Ethereum, uh, most of the of the top TBL ones, and and then going down the list a little bit, since the time of our launch, have not had any vulnerability, any exploit, and. Uh, it's really mixed feelings, you know, because uh, on one hand side, we're trying really to make this industry or this 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 space a, a more safe and more secure space. But at the same time, you can think in the back of your head that it could quite benefit you as a fairly early stage protocol to have a, an example of, a, of an insurance claim to be paid out in terms of the of the trust by the community, for example, to have a to have an insurance that has been uh, potentially claimed and and to have the track record there is is one of the things that at least one part of me is thinking that would be a good have uh, not consider of course considering that uh, you never want to see an exploit and you never want to be an effect affected in an in, in exploit so and usually nobody expects no one expects it until it happens to them yeah yeah as a matter of fact, uh, we're having a look into, into potentially running a, a proposal through through our community. If it would be interesting from from our members and eventually drop it on the on the Thor chain community as well, to to see whether it would be of interest to to eventually add the the Thor chain product as well. So, do you rank different? Um, uh, I don't know pr uh, protocols. Um, do you do you have? Are you allowed to share any of those statistics? Uh, yeah, we're fairly transparent in terms of how we rank the protocols with the N-scores rating. I must say that um, if there is any kind of previous exploits, as one of the factors in, into consideration. So a past track record from the from the protocol or the third party protocol in question is gonna is gonna be considered into the into the risk rating, and uh, potentially gonna increase a little bit on the on the um, on the premiums in, in in this case but we are we are very keen and have direct channels of communication with with pretty much every single protocol that you see in in our marketplace to eventually improve and, and upgrade the the security ratings because one of the important things as i was mentioning earlier with with how fast this the, the innovation and the, and the development is happening and in this industry is is to really try and keep up with 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 at least this part of the of the of the segment as well which is updating the the security ratings on on a fair manner based on the on the structure that we have provided yeah um so yeah. as a growth strategist for insure network um maybe you can elaborate on some of your plans to grow and tell us your vision um and your goals for you know the next one year four years beyond that, that maybe yeah so I was mentioning a couple of them earlier. Uh, we're really looking into the multi-chain environments right now. Uh, last couple of months since we launched on mainnet, we are looking uh, mostly on BSC and, and Polygon for, for launching in the, in the coming weeks and months. And uh, besides that, one of the quite exciting uh, points, which is uh, the community side, is about creating a more decentralized or, or constantly evolving on the decentralization aspect as well. So this is a not a pain point, but a circumstance for for many protocols where decentralization is often breached gradually, not from one day to another. And the way we feel, specifically for insurance, given the infant stages where where we are and all the different branches in term, in terms of the iterations and innovation that you will be seeing in the future, um, even though you can have a, a bit of a umbrella or not paternalistic, but like supporting view from from the team side. The motivation is really to try and drive this to a completely decentralized environment where the marketplace can idealistically in a, in a couple of year vista sustain by itself and eventually grow as a community and eventually build the necessary building blocks on, on that. So we're going to start with a fair amount of proposals for community engagement. We're going to drive forward with on with with different uh, governance levels for the token based from from our governance uh, token for for the interaction from the from the community, uh, motivated for the different proposals and the potential ideas and and, and suggestions from from the community. So the whole 
steps that you usually take down the road when you're looking towards taking the path of decentralization and, and DeFi protocols. So that's that's one of the one of the challenges that, or or the or the targets that we're having uh, uh, at this stage, together with expanding and together as as, as DeFi grows, basically. So uh, seeing any kind of uh, new protocols arising, making sure that uh, we, the, the insurance can be provided, which the, what the, which the potential community may be depending or of interest. And what I was mentioning earlier as well. So try and identify what may be the new niches and the new potential uh, segments that may be coming up uh, in terms of uh, providing that the community itself may not be interested, not, not knowing that they may be interested in. So um, one of I'm the- I'm actually a, a big m a member in the, the uh, Cardano community. I'm, I'm uh, pretty uh, rooted in that community and um, okay. I'm, I'm always in there. And uh, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm doing a series on inter of interviews with uh, Cardano founder, Cardano project founders just like I am doing with the Polkadot uh, series. But um, mm -hmm. th there are quite quite a few new decentralized exchanges and protocols, user-facing protocols that are coming out. You may have heard of uh, mm -hmm. a few of them. Um, one of the bigger ones right now, it, it's, uh, it's called Meld. I'm actually uh, reaching out to them now to get them on the show. But um, mm -hmm. how, how are you uh, approaching the all these new um decentralized exchanges how do you how do you evaluate that and are you planning on looking in the direction of say for example cardano okay so uh let's let's separate the, the two different questions in terms of how the approach is happening from a from a team to team level uh we found that uh, very often what you have is is it's not really us having to go to the to the new protocol to say we want to list you. It's actually the communities themselves saying how we how can we make it possible, and how can we actually maybe implement this in a more customer's way. So there's been a lot of conversation and brainstorming with with different protocols. Uh, recently, the the most recent one was with with Polygon and with with some of the protocols within Polygon that I cannot mention at this stage. But uh, eventually, looking at the the integrations with with them, because the demand is there from the community apart. So their own communities are saying, well, it could be interesting to have an insurance product. Could we get listed into into any kind of marketplace? And then some of the team members are eventually taking the the responsibility over reaching out reaching out to us and and seeing and finding a way to to eventually implement. I must admit, with some of the the more established ones, so uh, Ren Protocol, Balancer, like the more of the, of the top tier ones, especially for our first batch listing for the launch, we were reaching out ourselves for the for the collaboration, for the integration, and for the partnership. But that rapidly converted into, into a situation where you are having the protocols themselves actually reaching out. So the demand is there. And it's great to see that the maturity is eventually reaching to a point where not only the teams are reaching out, but apparently the, the, the community members are actually asking for, for the demand as well. And to go to the other question that, that you were mentioning for how it could be implemented with a chain like, like, like Cardano, for example. So first, I mean, of course, the, the challenges and integrations with, with every single chain in terms of uh, is it EVM compatible, which language, which coding uh, is going to be eventually needed for, for this kind of, uh, of chain and eventually find a framework under which you can adapt and implement the, the marketplace that we have built or whether eventually finding a, a new way of, of, of providing the, the insurance as well. Um, one of the things that we're considering right now with Polygon actually is a potential in the innovation zone because there's a lot of early stage projects. So the, the, the chain maturity on, on Polychain is that there's a lot of new things coming up instead of like very more uh, mastodons in terms of what you have in, 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 in the industry that have been established and, and with very robust TVLs. So creating an innovation zone with different dynamics may be something interesting to implement. But anyway, not to drift away too much with, with Cardano, it's it's basically a situation where the 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 established first layers in terms of, of of the protocols that are building on the chain should be at least there. So when you're when you're deploying an insurance protocol in in a, in an alternative chain or in a in a in a, in a complete new environment, um, you need to consider that you cannot be the first mover. 
of course you could be, but uh, there's no insurance products that you could eventually provide, at least for, for that same environment and the potential demand. So uh, considering from a priority perspective, it's always good to see that you are out already having those first building blocks. Uh, you were mentioning DEXs and a couple of other applications that you're going to be interviewing in, in this channel. So seeing that come to fruit and to into the development and see how the interaction is from a, from a user perspective, from a TVL perspective, to identify what's the risks, what's the amount of users which are eventually engaged, to see if, if it's worth catering to, to that environment. And once you have that, you can always eventually plug and play with, with your solution and always integrate and start eventually providing the insurance for the different um, protocols, applications, or whatever you may have. Yeah. yeah, so you're basically saying you need more data, more information uh, before you can uh, proceed with something like that. Yeah, a, a great example is uh, our situation with uh, drifting on the development on, on Polkadot. So we started develop, developing into a chain, which at the same time is in a, in a development stage. So when we started, you, you were seeing that uh, Kusama, the, the test net for, for Polkadot, was entering the, the testing phase for ramping up for the parachain auctions, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, at this stage, even the, the, the actual main chain, the, the relay chain and power chains and, and auctions for, for Polkadot itself is, is all also under, under other de development. It's, it's not reached maturity yet. So it's been one of the more, not premature, but I would say earlier bets on potential ecosystems and, and for the clear fact that uh, all the willingness to eventually deploy and, 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 and eventually develop on, on the Polkadot environment gained a lot of traction already. So that was one of the catalysts that we took as a success rate for, for us to say like, okay, maybe it makes sense with seeing all the vibrant, uh, not only community, but, but teams which are looking at migrations, implementations, integrations on, on Polkadot in our building already. It may make sense to, to start deploying because Polkadot itself is also a, a more unique environment. I was, I was mentioning about the, the different uh, programming languages that you may have, the different structure that you're having. Yes, you have some things like Moonbeam, which is an EVM compatible uh, sidechain, which you can implement too. But starting things earlier in, in that circumstance is not precisely bad. So you got to identify the, the potential trends as well. And um, I'm not saying that we're not looking at other chains. I mean, by, by all means, uh, from, from Avalanche to Cardano to, to all the different chains that, that have potential, we're keeping an eye on because if, if there's anything to happen over there, it's definitely going to be worth it to try and cater to, to that environment. And always the advantage as well of, of being the first mover in terms of, of the success of a, of a platform. So just to give some contrast versus the, the, the question of, of Cardano. So yes, you can always be looking at earlier stages, not really waiting for everything to be built. You know, you don't want to be the last one to eventually engage. It's just, it's just trying to state the environment or the situation that if you're the insurance protocol, once you are eventually deployed, uh, you do depend more than other protocols on the ecosystem itself because you're basically a supporting environment, supporting marketplace in our case, which is catering to users of other protocols. It's not like you're, you're gonna be the user of or our protocol, like a money market, for example, could be Ave, could be Compound, could be any of them, and you're just gonna be the, the user of our protocol in this case. And in the case of insurance, it's an adjacent, a, a plug-in service towards other established protocols and exposure that users may have already. So it's, it's more of a thing in between. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'd like to shift the conversation to your uh, experience at, in VC in venture capital. So as mm -hmm. uh, as we talked about before, you worked at uh, JRR Group as a uh, investment manager. Is that correct? Um, mm -hmm. Could you tell us what it means to be an investment manager? Um, uh, at a uh, venture capital firm, like what what was your what was your main primary uh, role, and how did you do yes. it? Yeah. So uh, the 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 first thing to say is that uh, investment management may vary across funds depending on the investment thesis. 
So there's different profiles in, in the industry. You can be having more equity-based, more token-based, more primary market, more early stage, more later stage, or secondary market uh, focus theses over the over the different uh, VCs. In my case, it was quite involved in terms of uh, the due diligence processes for, for the early stage investments for potential different vectors and, and segments. So uh, Nexus Mutual was, was one of the, the, the protocols that we were looking at the, at that time for a, for a potential, I'm, I'm not sure if it was a seed or the, or the private round in that case. So the whole due diligence that that composes eventually as well, and then presenting that to the, to the partners within the fund and eventually decision-making process. Some of the circumstances may involve uh, portfolio tracking, so uh, any, any kind of investment that, that you have eventually made is, is not only the, the tracking of your performance, like, like many uh, may be thinking, is also about seeing how you may be able to provide value. So having a quarterly call with certain portfolio projects for providing the needs and the quest and the, and the support on, on the quest for, for adoption to, to that protocol uh, is, is, is one of the, the, the concepts that you may be engaging quite a lot, whether it's on earlier stage or on later stage. In my case, I must admit is it was mostly uh, tokenized investments, uh, not that involved with the, with the equity side. Um, one of the exceptions is is the earliest investment into into Binance that, that JR was having. So the the seed round investment into into the equity side of, of, of what Binance was in terms of in, ter, in terms of, uh, in terms of an investment, plus the the convertible side for the for the token side. So does um, that mean yeah. when you say your tokenized investments, not equity investments, does that mean that? you're uh, getting access to buying uh, tokens at early pr uh, time for a, sp a specific price, um, but you're not necessarily taking any ownership in the, you know, in the protocol. Um, can you describe what, you know, a little bit more about the difference between tokenized uh, venture capital versus equity versus, uh, um, yes. See. So, you, you, you said a, a very important term here, which is taking ownership over a protocol. And this is related to understanding which kind of structure you're eventually engaging with as well. So there is uh, certain potential ventures that may be uh, able to, to combine and to coexist with both an equity structure and a, and a tokenized structure. But uh, first of all, to understand that there is... Uh, very often conflicts of interest between value capture on the equity side versus value capture on the tokenized side because eventually the whether it's protocol fees revenues value acquisition acquiral is going to be uh, structured in some way or, or another and uh, whether it's going to be funneled through an equity side or through the through the tokenized side very often tends to be tends to be challenging so there, there's plenty of success examples i mean i can think of, of ftx for example they, they were just raising their their latest round at the uh, uh, forgot the valuation at this stage but uh, we're talking about uh, the fairly big round at, at this stage and at the same time they have their own FTX, the FTX token so being clearly able to differentiate between that is, is one of the, the, the core concepts now what is important to understand as well between the equity and the tokenized rates as well is it really depends on which kind of protocol you're investing if, if, if you're really going into a into a into a venture engagement with a protocol which is aiming for decentralization which is increasingly striving at the, at this stage with uh, with with the whole uh, innovation that we're having in in defi it's it's a circumstance where you're mostly going to see uh, the potential investment in in tokenized uh, form so uh, back in 2017, we were mostly seeing the structure of a SAFT, of a simple agreement for future tokens, which was being accepted for, for certain jurisdictions. At uh, this stage, you're seeing a lot of uh, convertible equity notes, convertible equity into, into tokens as, as, as investment vehicle, merely from a, from a jurisdictional perspective, uh, from, a, from a regulatory perspective, sorry. And uh, understand that uh, if you're investing in that kind of decentralized protocol, well, taking ownership over the protocol means eventually engaging in, in that token. So if let's say you're taking a 
two percent share over uh, something like a money market, such as Compound, for example. Uh, you're being part of that community. You're being part of that protocol. So it's arguable, depending on where you look at it. From my perspective, you are taking ownership over the protocol. More than ownership, you're taking responsibility. Responsibility over engagement, uh, over the direction, whether it's in a more mature stage, over engaging in governance in, in, in proposals. So a lot of what we see in terms of governance engagement in, in DeFi at this stage is actually the VC side which is supporting those protocols on move on the right direction, uh, but also providing with the different means and resources that you can the, on the side, of course. So, yeah. So you were uh, not only investing, uh, but you were also supporting them by giving them uh, your you know, uh, intellectual resources as well as financial resources. In um, in our case, yeah. it was it was focusing on 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 a value adding uh, at least uh, uh, trying to to provide the resources and the value that that's possible to to give in in the in the realm of, of possibility, yeah. and um, yeah. And how does how does someone like yourself, an investment manager for a large VC firm, um, uh, go about selecting the criteria and what was the most predictive criteria for success in making your picks? Uh, over the time, if I had to pick one, uh, I, I would say this one, which is invest in people. Investing in people is very often what is going to turn the cards for you on a, on a positive manner in terms of success rates when we're talking about potential or more financial uh, driven results, because the, the teams are eventually the ones who are going to be behind the, uh, whether it's a more centralized or decentralized environment, whether behind the startup or behind the protocol to eventually bring things into an execution level. So. Yes, there can be plenty of ideas. And very often what you come across with is that you don't only have one team or one uh, venture, which is working on this kind of approach. You tend to see within a time frame of between three months and one year, a handful of different protocols, which are engaging in one or a different way with the, with the same um, identification of the problem that they're trying to solve and the execution of it. So eventually trying to find the right model and the right approach and the due diligence in that environment is important. But investing in people is, at least from my personal perspective, what, what has a very good conversion rate from a, from a more uh, financially uh, standpoint, financial standpoint. Uh, I couldn't agree more on that. Uh, investing in people. Very, very um, game this is not unique to This is not unique to, to blockchain. So no. I, I learned it in, in the blockchain VC industry, but uh, if you start conversing with more traditionally based uh, uh, venture capitals or, or incubators, uh, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of, of incubators here, here in China. One of the biggest at, a, biggest at a global scale, SOSB and China Accelerator are here in Shanghai. Uh, they invest across many different industries. And, and if you see the thesis, it's quite aligned with, with this, investing in, in, in founders, investing in people. And, and, and you can see across the space, it's, it's, quite, it's not really a secret. It's... I agree. Um, when I was living in, uh, in Miami, uh, Florida, there... Uh, it's, a, it's a huge uh, VC uh, community there, and there's a lot of tech entrepreneurs there. And now Miami is also now like blockchain capital of the United States, right? Yeah. Um, and when I was living there, uh, what I would do for fun was I would just go to uh, these pitchathons, and you would just watch one speaker after another, after another, after another. And then at the end, someone gets a you know a funding or a reward or some connections or. So I was really like fascinated by this, but yeah, uh, there was a lot of ideas, but at the end of the day, uh, it wasn't the idea that was impressive. It was a lot of times it was the person that was pitching it. And it's like, wow, yeah. I would definitely want to want that guy, you know, on my team. So um, I definitely uh, agree with you on what you said there. Um, what's a typical time frame of a VC investment? Like, what do you expect? How long do you expect to get that? You know, what, what were your expectations and hopes when investing in making picks? Okay, that's, that involves two things. And it's, uh, once again, the, the investment thesis uh, in terms of the timelines. So that's going to very likely going to be uh, 
limiting you in terms of the criteria on the stages that you may be interested in investing. So maybe not so interested on a, on a seed round investment or, a, or rather a series A if we're talking about equity or if we're talking about tokenized investment, which we're, I'm, I'm more familiar with uh, entering at a later stage in terms of in terms of rounds rather than an earlier stage. Um, but it, it really comes down to the, to the protocol execution, I would say. So, I mean, yes, there's plenty of cases where you can say that relationships eventually don't come to a fruitful result between the, the investment side and the, and, the, and the project building side. It, it can always happen or uh, situations where the, the success is just uh, more of a frustration and eventually it come with uh, across many various different pain points and eventually not really having the, the expectations of success that you may have um, yeah, expected basically. So, with the uniqueness with the tokens is that you tend to be in a fairly. It's, it's, it's the main difference towards equity is that uh, just considering the um, the lockups for the for the token locks uh, is, is is like having completely liquid private equity in in companies. Imagine startups where you're investing, where uh, if you're investing in Series A and in Series B at any point in time, you can eventually um, have the liquidity on the on the market. So that's a very differentiating factor that also drives in in terms of the the timeline as well, and and really depending on the protocol, uh, seeing in terms of the potential maturity if it's a success. So eventually achieving the level of of maturity that you feel comfortable with, that uh, you you could eventually feel that uh, partial profit taking. Uh, situation may be the right timing at this stage, could be also related with timing the market. But if uh, eventually circumstances or situations are not as predicted, that you also have the choice eventually on the on the release of the market as well. And this is a very big controversy as well. So there's, I mean, plenty of examples I uh, that, that that there's been in the in the past uh, that where there's the more positive side of, of VC and there's the more negative side of VC and uh, picking the right investors especially on on tokenized investments is, is really going to help you out on throughout your career as an entrepreneur with the venture that you're building as well so back to the question it really depends on the thesis it depends on the maturity of the of the protocol so it's not the same uh, to be investing in a, in a potential idea that may be taking one and a half years vista on, on not only executing the development, but the potential adoption from the, from the community because the stage is mature enough than investing in something which is more of a five to 10 year vista, for example. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you take the comparison, investing into a protocol like Aave or Compound, they have been seeing fairly fast adoption. Towards if you see uh, investment in a protocol which is a uh, layer one, I mean Ethereum by itself is is a is an investment with uh, at least five to ten year time span before eventually looking at the potential profit taking environment. If you are very aligned with the with the thesis with the development and with the with the production of of, of what's actually happening, you know. So yeah. it it really depends. I, I always, uh, in my mind, I always imagine that VC uh, firms, um, they're all a little bit different, but, you know, more, more yeah. on the long-term side, uh, you know, the, the five, 10 year side, but then you have stories about VC that all they want to do is exit and as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. But um, it, it's, to me, it's always been a fascinating and elusive world. Um, I'd love to learn more about it. Yeah. I don't want to point at fingers or say the more negative aspects of the industry, but uh, yes, for good or for bad, you, you also have those kind of actions, basically with, with tokenized investments where, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm right now talking as an entrepreneur, but I can talk as, a, as an XPC uh, yeah. where you're having the, the more short-term profit-seeking uh, institutional investors. And, and they're very clearly identifiable. Who, who are some yeah. of the more yeah. prominent VCs um, today in crypto that you look up to, that you respect? Without a doubt, I would tend to say Paradigm. Uh, they're one of the cornerstone VCs that across cycles, uh, they, they have been just seeklessly finding the right people to, to fund and, and, and really supporting from, from day one. 
the the data side, the, the research from from paradigms is is, is very exquisite. I, I tend to read quite quite a fair bit from from what is is being uh, published on on that side, and the people who are engaged. Uh, the, so we're talking about ex co-founder of of Coinbase, uh, one of the the profiles that was uh, getting involved recently, for example, with paradigm Sam C Zan. Uh, he is a pseudo anonymous profile on on Twitter, uh, but uh, engaging with with parting on the on the research side and, and on different verticals. He's a, he's one of the most prominent white hat hackers. So this has an overlap with uh, with the insurance uh, side, where he has been uh, actually stopping and avoiding some of the some of the exploits as as they were happening, as as, as he was identifying them, for example. And and those kind of people who they have been on the entrepreneurial side, they have been having the expertise, they have been having the proven experience, and they know how to provide the resources and 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 the value in, in a very sophisticated way. To their founders, is is somebody I can I can really look up to. I could say a couple of other names. I mean, there's there's a sixteen C and a couple of uh, DeFi entrepreneurs that have turned into 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 venture capitalists. I mean, Robert Leshner, for example, has has pivoted a little bit with his Robert Ventures into into venture capital as well. Uh, there's there's plenty of them that you can eventually look up to. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, this is this is more of of the of the native uh, crypto scene, I would tend to say as well. So you have a couple of more traditional investors, so uh, SoftBank Investment, Bain Capital, and uh, a couple of other are some of the more tradfi, if you want to call them like this, or traditional investors that have been looking into into blockchain for for the last couple of years as well, and they are also giving the the level of of, of of establishments that they have uh, at the, the size as well, they they are allowed themselves to have a different uh, philosophy, a different investment thesis as well. So when we were talking about earlier on the investment thesis and all the timelines, that's something that they can allow themselves when some of the VCs, even if they wanted to, given the rapid changing dynamics and the environment and maybe the limitations from their uh, limited partners from the LP side eventually, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a raised fund, uh, they, they also tend to have their limitations as well. So, yeah. Very, very interesting. Thank you again. Um, Sorry, let, let me interfere once, once go more. Go ahead. No, no, uh, please. Because there's there's various types of, of, of VCs. So one of the things that I'm quite uh, enthusiastic as an individual in terms of in terms of in terms of the the development in, in crypto is, is decentralized funding. So uh, Meta Cartel Ventures uh, by Peter Pan and and, and the, co the whole community is one of the great uh, the best examples I've been found uh, I've, I've been able to find from their past track records on their involvement. Uh, with a completely different uh, structure as well, because it's 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 basically being almost governed, or without the almost, it's being governed like a DAO. Uh, it's it's a decentralized autonomous organization which is invested, and uh, it's it's per permission to join, as if I remember remember well. But uh, that kind of structure is something that I believe is going to be establishing itself more and more. And if you want to take one of the references, there are some some great structure to look at Meta Cartel. I will definitely uh, be looking into that. Yeah. And um, anybody else who is listening out there who is interested in that, I'm sure they will as well. Um, the The next question I have is actually about your consulting experience. Um, the thing that fascinates me the most is that you uh, you did some consulting with the Italian, um, basically the government, right? Yeah, with with the ex with the former Under Secretary of State when he was in a visit to to Shanghai, basically, he was mm -hmm. formerly. So where did you meet him in in China, in Shanghai? Uh, in Shanghai. Was it, it in was the, in Shanghai, right? And in, so the, that... in the Italian embassy, he called for for some hearings for from different uh, incubators, entrepreneurs, and, and venture capital to understand more on the on the blockchain side and how to eventually connect it between between Italy and, and China and the potential benefits of it. Yeah. So you you are uh, still in the t at the time still in venture capital. Uh, yes, it was actually uh, fairly early in my in my venture capital days. It was the first. It was towards the first of the towards the end of the first year. Yeah, yeah. 
and and so you uh so you met him at the embassy what did you consult about i mean can you go into that a little bit uh yeah i could provide some insights so basically uh you have to part from a circumstance where you need to understand the the level where you can start engaging so it's not like the conversation that we've been having for the for the past hour you can start like that it's 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 uh starting for a more entry level point and always rooting back to real world use cases and the potential maturity of the industry. So starting with, from a very advanced uh, niche jargon and uh, niche expertise on talking about uh, the different implementations on the different uh, uh, different blockchains that can be utilized for this and for that was not the case. So we were starting for a more from a more general perspective, almost an introduction into into blockchain to at mm. least have the the avatars per, per se, and then eventually pinpointing into the into the different use cases that you could have at least at that stage. I was I was mentioning the 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 tampering of the of the luxury goods for the for the verification of originality so very focused on the on the e-commerce side on the potential trade collaboration uh, some of the certificates that could be used some of the supply chain that could be eventually put uh, on chain and then some of the protocols at the time i forgot the names that were looking at that and eventually identifying some of the criteria in terms of how it could be interesting to engage in terms of uh, having a sandbox, for example, for incentivizing this kind of development to reach maturity and to be able to adopt it in the in the following years, uh, as well as looking at uh, the different ways that that you could look the the development going in which direction and try and eventually understand that as well. So trying to understand first on, on one hand side what is happening in the industry, on on the other hand side how it, how it could be supported from a from from their perspective and in terms of the the, the, the Italian government at, at the time <clears throat> or the or the undersecretary for for economic development and then just some some side points in terms of the the potential niche use cases that may be willing or interesting to explore at that stage and and the the, the, the specific use cases between the the at least at the time the questions that he was having was was really focused between that between the Italian Chinese uh, collaboration Mm. and uh, and fruitful commerce so the the, the support of that um yeah. this is a great jump off point for us to talk about the the new chinese digital yuan um hmm. so there i mean i don't from my perspective you know i'm you know westerner here in the united states um way we see it here is china is uh working towards their goal of becoming the world's uh, reserve currency. Um, would you agree that that's what their goal is right now? It's on its way. I mean, uh, monetary policy is, is there are certain contrasts versus how it's been taken versus the, the US dollar, I would tend to say. Yeah. Um, but the CBDC is, is, is one of the great points of innovation where I was very surprised that uh, China was able to move this fast, while other yeah. uh, jurisdictions, other countries have been rather uh, reluctant or careful, uh, especially with the with the regulation of it before it's even taken to a testing environment. So, the the closest example I could have thought of when when CBDC, China Bank Digital Currency, was starting to come up, which has been around for a couple of years uh, so uh, i believe uh, late 20 mid 2019 it was probably when what the first paper uh, su su suggestion was was eventually coming out for the for the ideas and eventually uh, setting up a team and and deploying some some test cases for the for the trials for it uh, the 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 closest example for it i could have thought of was the the stage of of, of libra so well where, where facebook was was looking at at libra for the for the deployment and um, that was being pretty much shut down from yeah. from my understanding it was uh, it was being it got killed from a from a regular re regulatory perspective mm -hmm. and uh, at least in that jurisdiction it was not able to to take place i don't know how the plans and the stages are for for facebook but uh, we have not seen anything close to what China has been aiming and actually consistently taking different milestones on on, on actually moving forward with, which is the which is the CBDC. It was about a year ago that they started doing the first trials in Shenzhen, 
in, in closed environments in a couple of other cities. And we just got to a point where I believe it was a couple of weeks ago, there already is a, a preset interface where you can see the, the digital yuan in, in some of the bank applications. Mm. Yeah. So I, I what, are, what are some personally, of the... but I've seen it on some friends' applications. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Like how how much how could you measure the you know, amount of adoption that has occurred? Is there some statistic that you can share with us? Like how many how much percent of uh, currency is currently digitized in their uh, circulation, or how how many uh, uh, how much currency is currently being spent uh, um, exchanged um, yeah. on a daily basis, or is there some kind of figures that you could share with us on that? So it's it's still in a testing phase. So everything which you have seen is is different stages oh. of of trials and and tests. It's not that it has been officially launched, I see. Uh, but it's apparently closer than it than it looks. Uh, I mean, the, one of the, the the biggest improvements or or advancements was to see uh, the the application interface, you know, that was eventually coming up. Uh, but I'm not able to engage with with CBDC at this stage if if, if I wanted to. Um, oh. So that's so, probably one of the misconceptions. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It seems to us here that that you know China is already pretty much you know getting on, like you know a heavy adoption and people are just using it now. But it sounds that you're saying is that it's still in testing. It's still not being widely used yet, and you couldn't even use it if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay. So if if you take a step back and and you talk about digitalization mm. of of the yuan. Yeah. Uh, that's been something where China took a leap forward about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, uh, I cannot remember last time I touched fiat, uh, physical uh, physical bank wow. notes, money yeah. in, in China. So everything works via uh, QR codes, Alipay is, is one of the main interfaces, mm -hmm. uh, WeChat, which is the, the analog of, of WhatsApp in, in China, is, is, a, is a super app where you can eventually not only uh, pay for for any kind of goods and services directly through a quick scan you can be eventually booking any kind of or uh, flights trains or uh, e-commerce everything is in a in a digital environment already mm -hmm. so the levels of adoption of, of of digital yuan is is massive mm -hmm. so the blockchain base, the blockchain uh, base. Yeah alternative of it which is the cbdc is still a testing yeah. phase i see yeah there's the distinction that you know i wasn't aware yeah. of as, yeah uh, yeah it makes a lot of sense now that you put it that way but it seems that people are already trained to do that and people are already trained to use everything digital not use uh paper money anymore so it's the transition mm. will be pretty much probably going to be like seamless um practically right well, that's that's one of the big points yeah. here is that uh, from a user perspective, uh, mm -hmm. you're basically not going to see the difference. It's yeah. just going to be QR codes being uh, scanned around and just different interfaces. Yeah, it, it just shows how far behind we are here in the States. I mean, yeah. uh, I can't even get a haircut without paying with paper yeah. money. You know, it's like a yeah. lot of these people, like these local vendors and stuff like that still are, you know, uh, cash only sometimes. And yeah yeah it's i don't know i was i was mentioning earlier i was just four years ago or four and a half uh i was i was i was studying in germany and germany is a is a country which is fairly uh not really keen towards adoption over credit cards and any kind of credit system so um, even having a card uh, system is is not the the preferred way to go a lot of it is is, is also cash based so people are very used to having their debit cards and and going out for for the for the atm and eventually having their cash where where they're paying around because you're not even sure if it's going to be accepted everywhere mm. so it was a big contrast to to move from 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 germany to, to china in this case and and i mean after after three months in, in china i realized i i didn't need a wallet anymore mm. A physical wallet where you would eventually be storing the the different uh, cards or the or the or the or the bank notes you know because mm -hmm. everything is on your phone yeah and soon to go beyond that just your phone even yeah just on yeah. your person so to you know. give some background information yeah. on this uh yeah. to understand cbdc uh the biggest innovation or or the or the biggest leap forward which is being taken is in the in the back end 
Mm. Okay, so it's the it's the way of of accounting of transferability and traceability over the digital yuan, which is taking a next step in in terms of evolution, if you if you can put it this way, blockchain based technology, but uh, far away from what we understand from what a public public uh, blockchain is. So from from Ethereum in, in this case, mm. so it's it's still uh, an enclosed environment. Interesting. So it's a blockchain, yeah. but only certain people have access to the ledger and uh, all that data is basically being uh, collected. And uh, what is going to be analyzed. available to the public is basically the, the front end side. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm very doubtful that we're going to have the CBDC Explorer the, or the CBDC scan, the same way we have an Ether scan. Uh, uh -huh. this, it's not really the, the same kind of uh, approach or, or applicability here. Yeah. But uh, to see the innovation, that at least in the back end, a massive piece of infrastructure such as a national currency of the size of the digital of, of the renminbi of the yuan, is looking forward to take the step. It's it's interesting times to see, and uh, okay, and yeah, quite curious to see the adoption. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's fascinating and something I like to ponder upon: uh, what the world is mm. going to look like, what the world of money is going to look mm -hmm. like, and. Um, you know what money will eventually become right uh eventually it's just going to be value exchange between people you know uh how do you measure that you know i don't know it's just going to be some kind of um invisible connection between all of us transferring value between uh mm. person to person that's just my perspective on it but um let's talk about um i, I heard you say once before that uh, regulation is not proactive it's reactive um, what are some of the more recent things that have caused um, newer regulations? Uh, maybe in, you want to maybe even elaborate that from a local perspective, from Shanghai. You, you know, feel free to elaborate on that even globally. Uh, I'd love to know more about regulation and your thoughts on that. Hmm. Like what's coming? Uh, we should we we should have done this interview a week later because on Monday I'm going to have exactly one one panel discussion that I was organizing for crypto money is about international regulation with uh, with quite a few good profiles about it. Mm. But anyway, I can I can give you some insights. Yeah. So the the situation with with regulation and we have seen this with any kind of technologies. It was with Web one, Web two, Web three, eventually with any kind of uh, different niches with within within innovation. Um, the 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 re regulatory arm tends to be adapting towards this coming in, in terms of innovation, and blockchain is no exception in this. So crypto is 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 exactly that. What we're seeing is as it unfolds, as it evolves, as we are maturing, you are seeing the different uh, approaches that some jurisdictions are taking, uh, rather more keen or rather more restrictive towards trying to create a. Uh, a framework for for at least uh, creating a regulation in order to protect uh, certain actors in, within within society. Uh, the, one of the key components eventually is this anti money laundering, which is uh, becoming one of the increasingly big topics and, and threats recently in in Europe. It was being mentioned uh, that uh, they wanted to censor any kind of transfers up to a certain extent between Ethereum uh, non custodial wallets. I believe it was uh, between Ethereum wallets. Not the non-custodials because they're literally not uh, able to with with, with open source non-custodial so, uh, software or code, but uh, you can see that it's an increasingly big concern as we're moving forward, and especially with the last year, year and a half that we're having with 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 the bus that that came back on on crypto and 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 Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc. I mean the the levels of exposure that we got, the levels of institutional adoption that we got was increasing at a, at a dramatic dramatic pace, uh, path and uh, pace and um, seeing jurisdictions actually come up with their own way on on trying to create that framework is something that I'm very much looking forward because it can be one of the key catalysts for or against the maturity of this industry so speaking from a more uh, analytical or investment driven mindset here uh, the same way that you can have more friendly sandbox such as singapore tried to uh, tried to provide since since 2017 or hong kong started looking at in 2019 i believe it was to try and and be a bit more permissive but at the same time creating the framework and regulated you can have the more restrictive 
environment, which is eventually capping down. Just the other day, we're seeing how uh, certain asset classes were being limited uh, within the Uniswap interface for, for trading, mostly derivative assets and, and, and synthetics. So it's, it's really one of the things to be looking at because it's, it's going to pay it's going to be shaping how this industry may be evolving in a more inclusive and, and adaptable uh, environment where adoption is going to be easier or if certain jurisdictions are more restrictive with the, with the environment where it may go towards an environment where it's drifting into a, into a parallel, uh, not world, but not the, maybe even metaverse, you know, where, where everything is more and more happening on chain and, and, and creating that, 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 that own ecosystem of itself, the same way that we saw first with blockchains, then with eventually multi-chain, and now going to the next step eventually of, of things just purely happening on chain, uh, which I would tend to like to avoid to see to to see the the, the avoidance and the exemption of, of regulation because if you want adoption, uh, which is one of the things that I believe uh, most of us thrive for, you need to comply. In, in certain aspects and, and in certain ways. And the best way that you can move forward with that is to try and, and find a regulatory framework, which is both not capping and, 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 and killing the, the innovation, uh, but at the same time providing the, with the tools and with the means that, that or the protection from, from a more, um, from, from the perspective of, of society as well. So I, uh, this, this six, this opinion may be arguable. I mean, I got friends which are more of an anarchic point of view towards crypto, people who have a more uh, traditional perspective over crypto. Uh, it's uh, definitely arguable. I'm just sharing my own. But uh, Well, since you're on, you know, I, this is exactly why I wanted to uh, have you on here, because uh, you definitely have some unique perspectives. Um, you know, you speak to, I know uh, you mentioned before that you're in contact with um, different, uh, you know, people in uh, uh, high places, uh, uh, yeah. gov regulators, and you speak to them regularly. So it's good to be on on top of that. But here, since you've got so, uh, some experience in this area, this is a question that I'd like to ask you. What is something you believe about regulation that most people would disagree with you about? Well, that's a tough one. What would be what most people would disagree with me in terms of regulation that I believe is, is positive towards regulation? There's a lot of controversy and debate over, over trying and create the frameworks which, which are really appropriate for, for DeFi. And uh, at least what I'm coming across recently is uh, DeFi, at least many people are, are striving towards the point which part of me kind of agrees, uh, shouldn't be uh, under the umbrella of any jurisdiction. From a, from a fundamental perspective, uh, this is no local company or local jurisdiction, local environment, which is being established. We're looking at for the first time, a global environment, not only of a, of a global currency, which could be taken in terms of Bitcoin or Ethereum or different assets, but also a developer community, which you're creating that uh, should, at least from opinions of, of some, not even be touched from a, from a, from a regulation perspective. And everything which is trying to regulate it is, is wrong. From, from my perspective, I would tend to disagree. And uh, I would be very willing to see that uh, to be explored and to move forward, at least in a friendly manner, where the regulators can, can take the time and understanding and adapt towards the, toward, towards the implementation of the, of, the, of the innovation which is happening in the industry in a way without it's going to be killed. So it's related to what I was mentioning to, on, the, on the previous question. And it's something which is it's, it's clearly having quite a bit of controversy in the, in the recent months. And it's... So it's, you're saying yeah. that uh, regulation within the uh, spectrum of DeFi, it sh it's um, fundamentally should not... Uh, should not have regulation. Is is that would you, along those lines? Would you? Is that what you're saying? I would tend to say that ideally you should have a framework that has some kind of regulation, so that you can have the establishment and the adoption for it. So that my my main point for it is is the adoption. Hello. Oh, sorry, sorry. So um, just a few more questions for you. By the way, that was a really good answer. Um, it's always good to. 
um, hear uh, from someone who who has a lot of experience in in certain areas to hear what your what your beliefs are that are sort of counter from what mm -hmm. the mainstream thinking is because oftentimes yeah. when things change it goes in those directions. Um, I'd like yeah. to ask you uh, about your life in Shanghai a little bit. Um, so what what's it what is it like to uh, to have lived how long have you lived there for now it's been past four years yeah. okay do you speak mandarin cantonese uh fair little bit uh mm -hmm. i've been too focused and busy with with blockchain i would tend to say so i could have been studying more mandarin yeah but uh yeah at least enough to be to be eventually moving moving around with it when you're communicating with people in the public um how do you do that do you use a translation or daily tasks or, or daily environments whether it's a uh, transport uh, restaurants uh, any kind of like small dogs or vendors whatever it is it should be in in, in, in chinese you you don't have the alternative yeah. of, of speaking in english most of the time yeah some people survive with translators but i i couldn't i couldn't, I couldn't be dealing with that situation i mean you you got to be at least keen to 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 understand the the bare minimum and to and to take that, that little bit further so you uh, if you we're talking have... about you do have that yeah. bare minimum yeah yeah very yeah interesting. i would tend to say like minimum intermediates yeah uh, yeah not at the professional scale native but uh but enough to get you slowly back. slowly getting there yeah yeah so i'm gonna learn a couple of thousand characters um let's let me this is this is gonna be one of my final questions and um it has to do with economics actually what's the biggest mm -hmm. difference between chinese and Western economics. What's the the approach? Maybe you can talk about, um, you know, the the ideology, the the difference between how people think here, how people think there, in terms of money, finance, economics. What would you say is a distinction or a few distinctions between the two uh, cultures when it comes to economics and money? This is a topic that could be taken on for hours. Just, just <laughs> this question. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll leave it as a jump-off point for our next interview. But let's let's get a few <laughs> examples. <laughs> yeah. So I can tell you one of the biggest misunderstandings, uh, misconceptions that I had before and after coming to China. Okay. Um, before coming to China, I was. Uh, I heard of or understood that uh, China was a fairly uh, communist environment in terms of politics. Okay. Uh, what I learned is that, at least from economic and political reforms, it has been iterating quite often and evolved in terms of what has been adopted. So it's, it's been constant development on, on that hand side. So the way I would put it is that at least in, in, the, in the past 20 years, it has been trying to be a more uh, meritocracy-based system rather than a, than, a, than a, apologies for that, than a political system, than a, than a communist system. It's, it's, it's really not, it's, it's very drifted away from what you could call Marxism. Mm. Uh, and, and that's one of the big misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, at least uh, from what I saw in, in, in Shanghai and, and then further moving across uh, different uh, cities and, and, and parts of China, is that it's the most capitalist country that I've ever seen in my life. Oh, wow. Tell me yeah, more. In terms, of, in terms of consumption, in terms of uh, consumer goods, in terms of uh, like the, the, the economy by itself, like the, 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 the willingness, the drivenness of eventually uh, not only succeeding, from, from a financial perspective, uh, as an individual, as a corporate, as, a, as an institution, and the, and the vast opportunity as well. Because uh, if, if you're succeeding in, in, in whichever industry it is in China, the opportunity for you to succeed, is not like you're gonna be succeeding in a, in a sample size such as Spain, which is 40 million people, or Germany, which is 85 million people. We're talking about 1.6, 1.7 billion people. Wow. So success mean, means something very different. I see. I see. And uh, and that's in terms of uh, not only from the from the financially uh, driven incentives that you have rooted in society, but also the consumeristic patterns that that you tend to see was something that I was very surprised with with seeing 
and all sorts of luxuries are, are, are being more than found. What I like to say from, from the early days when I was starting to live in Shanghai is that it's a city where you can live with so little in terms of like monthly wage, but in terms of limits, there, there, there's, there's no limit to the upside. Mm, interesting. So it's, this is a little bit from a, from a more uh, economic and, and political and, and society-driven approach that I've seen. Um, if we talk about contrasts, uh, I was mentioning a monetary system earlier with the, with the whole electronic payments and everything. This is, this is one of the, the biggest contrasts that, contrasts that, that, that I've seen as well. Um, what else to mention? From a cultural perspective, there, there's there's center, certain differences as well, where we're talking about the, the corporate structures and and the economic approach towards towards it. There's there's certain differences that that you can see uh, versus what we know as as a more established democracy, whether it's on the on the U.S. or or European based countries. So so there's there's plenty of differences that that you can eventually point out. But at the same time, if, if I had to resume this in a way, it's, it's a very dynamic and evolving country from, from many aspects. Mm. And, and that's part of what, what brings in the contrast to, to like um, loop back in, into blockchain where um, on one hand side, it's um, very limited and regulated, or not regulated, but limited in terms of what can be done. With, with crypto, for example, uh, having uh, Bitcoin or, or Ethereum used as means of payment and, and that being adopted at a, at a national scale is something that uh, has been put a lot of effort that you're not being able to see this until now and very unlikely you will see it in the future given the, the mon monetary policy uh, approach that you're having towards the Chinese trend. So it, it may represent a potential challenge towards the sovereignty of a currency. If you're having something like uh, Bitcoin being upset, uh, accepted or Lightning Network to be accepted for, for paying for a coffee or things like that. So yeah, that's a little bit of a sneak peek that I could think of. The most capitalistic uh, country or city uh, city in the world, you just, would you, did you say city or country? Uh, I said country. Yeah. Uh, I should probably have said because you can really narrow this down to to to, to cities. So uh, there was a, a plan of development for for cities that was put set into place. I think I'm not sure if it was uh, 50 or 30 years ago. Yeah. And those 16 first uh, cities that were within the plan for for economic development have really seen this growth and uh, it's it's basically on the on the east coast of, of china going yeah. from the from the upside to the to the to the down uh, all the way down uh, it's it's a it's a massive difference if, towards yeah. if you if you go to to other regions of of of, of mainland china yeah. yeah very very interesting um uh, we want to thank you so much for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us today and your experience uh, and uh, I want to ask you if someone wanted to uh, know you a little bit more, follow you online, uh, what would they do to do that? Yeah, so they can find me and, and my whole team uh, on the Ensure Network page, so ensure.network. And uh, the profiles are directly available over there. So my LinkedIn is, is public, our, our, our team members uh, LinkedIn is public. Um, email wise, alvaro at ensure.network, Twitter, alvaro K O K E 27, uh, Telegram, crypto alva. There's, there's plenty of ways. <laughs> so, the, uh, Alvaro Fernandez, yeah. everyone, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.